Good day, I'm Dr. T and welcome to my office. And that was way too cheery for what I'm talking about today because I am talking about a pair of books, both by uh, Nathan Graw. The first of his series is The Demographics of Demand in Higher Education. Okay, almost got that title right. Second one is The Agile College. Uh, both books are definitely must reads for anyone in higher education, although they are definitely ominous reads. Uh, so why are they ominous and what are they about? Well, the issue that uh, Graw is pointing out is that if you look at higher education, for the last hundred or so years, it has been a growth field. More and more students have been going to college, getting college degrees, and by extension, that means we need more colleges, more college teaching faculty. Great gig to be in. Well, that is ending here soon. Uh, at least within the United States. And this is definitely a US-centric uh, discussion here. Every country and region has their own um, internal and external issues. So I'm definitely gonna be focusing with respect to the United States. Anyways, uh, the point of this issue ends up being with uh, general United States demographics, or specifically birth rate. If you look at a general trend of U.S. birth rate, it's usually given by births per woman, kind of the easiest way to track this. Um, it obviously was much higher than it dropped off mid-20th century, you know, the end of the baby boom. Uh, had a bit of a dip in the 1980s, but for the most part has held constant at around two children per woman. Uh, and this is what's known as replacement. You want a little over two children per woman in order to maintain the size of the society. Uh, basically, one child to replace her, one child to replace her male partner, and then a, on average, slightly more than one child uh, as a replacement for any children who don't make it to adulthood. I know, really kind of a morbid way of thinking about this, but I mean, that is kind of what's going on. Now, if we're looking at our uh, chart of U.S. birth rates, what we find is that briefly in the 1980s, it dipped below replacement, and after 2008, it has dipped below replacement and is constantly going down. Uh, now, for us in higher education, why does this matter? Well, you don't enroll 100% of students who were not born. If they weren't born, they're not going to college. Uh, fairly straightforward. Now, college enrollments have been going up even as birth rates have gone down because the percentage of students who are going to college has increased. Uh, back 100 years ago, very few students went to college, only a tiny fraction of them. Now, a majority of students uh, after they leave high school will at least spend some time in a college setting. Well, we've reached the point where that percentage is probably not going to go up. It may actually go down slightly and fluctuate a bit but it's not going to be going up meaningfully because we pretty much reach saturation. There are some underrepresented groups that we might be able to um, enroll more students from if we did appropriate outreach, and we are trying to do that, but that's what we have been doing for a good many years. And the end result is that we have addressed most of those concerns, at least to the low-hanging fruit, and it's unlikely we're going to be able to increase the percentage of students enrolled. This means, though, that with a drop-off after the 2008 recession in birth rate, then there will be a declining in the population, uh, at least those native-born to the United States, going into college. Therefore, less students, uh, and that is going to have some consequences for us. Uh, Graw goes into a lot of detail, different regions where demographics, whether people moving to or from or having children, etc., are going to have more or less impacts. But for us faculty, I don't think that really makes such a big deal since we typically f you know, move around when we find jobs. If we're looking for a education position, I don't know about y'all, but when I was looking for mine, I did about a 46 state search, maybe a 40 state search. There was a few states that I was just like, nope, I don't want to live there, or their state governments are not fiscally responsible enough for me to tie my career to their government. Uh, but otherwise, I'm looking at most of the states whenever I look for jobs, and you know, hopefully not looking for any anytime soon, but you get the general idea. Uh, but with that said, a decreasing number of students is going to cause financial strain on basically all institutions. Graw points out that the elite institutions, you know, the Harvards, the MITs of the world, these are not going to be affected. Um, they might have a slightly 
diminished pool, they might have to lower their standards for enrollment a tiny, tiny amount, but they're not going to have a major impact. Uh, it's the smaller schools that are going to be affected. The ones that students who are more locally uh, traveling, the ones who are from you know two, three hours away going to that school, not typically coming from all over the world to attend that particular school. These are the schools that are going to be affected the most. And the school is going to have to cut budgets because they have fewer students. The end result for us as faculty is going to be fairly straightforward. Less students means less need for educators. So there will be fewer faculty positions. Additionally, with more constrained budgets, then schools are going to wish uh, really to get more efficiency out of their faculty. So a greater push towards adjunct faculty, which really is not cool in most situations. It's, if you get the opportunity to do adjunct teaching, just don't. Uh, as well as a push for non-tenure track professionals uh, who typically have higher teaching loads, this would be myself in this case, uh, typically have higher teaching loads and have slightly lower salaries. Therefore, on a per student basis, cost less to employ uh, to educate students. Additionally, not having tenure means that if enrollments drop, you can let the non-tenure track go very easily, giving the school more flexibility. All of this is not good for us. Uh, in general, you know, tenure track positions, if you want to do the scholarly activity, are typically preferred. Uh, now, I don't want to do scholarly activity. I've done scientific research. I did not like it. And if I don't have to do it again, that would be awesome. Uh, but it would be nice for an option. Additionally, that does mean that the number of individuals competing for different faculty positions is going to go up. Now, if you're like myself and in the STEM fields, that also means though that while there's less faculty positions, there will be other industry positions out there uh, working for outside of the education or outside of the academic realm, uh, which will definitely, you know, feed off at least some of the competition. So, you know, you can either decide, maybe I'm not going to deal with academia, I'm going to leave academia, or at the very least, the competitors for the job might very well do the same. So there's going to be a little bit of a balance for us in the STEM fields and in things like business, but in a lot of the humanities, this is really going to hurt uh, because there's not really that feed uh, for an alternate uh, job pathway in several of the, the humanities. There, you know, there, there are other jobs that folks with degrees in humanities can get, but the ones that won't necessarily really utilize their degree in the same way as they may hope to do so. So yeah, um, what are we going to be seeing as faculty other than end of the decade, late 2020s, early 2020s, 30s, a really unpleasant job market? We're probably also going to be looking at uh, schools requesting higher teaching loads. Once again, get more money or well, to be honest, get more money, get more teaching from uh, the same number of faculty. Uh, a more competitive environment, probably more online courses, which if you were in 2020, yeah, that was not fun. Um, both books were written pre-pandemic, uh, even though the actual college was released, I believe, what, late 2020, early 2021. Um, it was definitely written pre-pandemic, so that that's not factored into what's going on. That said, we could be seeing you know increased push to more, shall we say, consumer-friendly approaches, which may very well get some backlash. That's just my prediction, uh, not Graz. Uh, and there's also going to be a, really a push to cut costs. I'm seeing this within my institution, where there's definitely a push for open educational resources, which, to be honest, I'm all for. Uh, a lot of the textbooks don't really, they don't justify their price. Uh, so there's going to be definitely a push for more open educational resources, as well as reduction in miscellaneous fees, which of course could make laboratory classes a little bit more interesting if you don't have lab fees to buy chemicals and whatnot. This could get a little bit problematic trying to do labs on shoestring budget. So take home message on this one. Uh, Definitely read both books. They're worth the read. I have barely scratched the t surface. This is ominous reading, though. I'm going to warn you. Uh, not a fun read. Uh, not in the case of it's not. He's not. He's a good writer. Uh, I do recommend. Once again, he's a good writer. I do recommend reading it. But it's definitely ominous for anyone whose livelihood is in higher education. 
So yeah, I'd say have a wonderful day, but this probably didn't help you on that. So try and have a wonderful day.